I've spent the last 35 years with people talking to me about sex, and there's one topic they talk to me more about than anything else, and that's the whole issue of mismatched desire. Women talking about dreading the hand coming creeping towards them in the middle of the night. <laughs> Men talking about spending their lives groveling for sex, or having sex doled out to them like meaty bites to a dog. We only have to look around us to realise how common this is. There are endless stories and jokes about this whole issue of mismatched desire. I suppose my favourite is about the cow from Woi Woi. There's a little town in Victoria that has this cow that stops giving milk and the people are very upset and they decide they have to get a new cow and they go to Woi Woi and find this terrific cow which they bring home with them and it's wonderful and it's producing all this milk and they decide we have to breed with this cow. And so they bring in a bull, and every time the bull comes near the cow, the cow backs away. And they just don't know what to do, and they go to their local vet, and they explain what's going on. And he says with a distant look, they, they say to him, you know, what, what's going on here? And he says to them, does this cow come from Woi Woi? And they're most surprised, how does he know this? He says with a distant look in his eye, my cow, my wife is from Woi Woi. <laughs> I noticed Steve Martin the other day saying, you know that look women get in their eyes when they want sex? Me neither. <laughs> so the problem is well and truly out there. Um, and I was really interested to see how we could get at that. How do couples negotiate that difference between them? We know there's a real issue that we had a very big survey done in Australia a few years ago where 55% of women who were surveyed, nearly 20,000 people in the survey, 55% of the women said they had low desire. So there's a very big problem out there between couples. And I had this inspiration of maybe I could get couples to keep diaries for me about, about how they negotiate their sex supply. And so I recruited all these people, I went on radio and asked people to come along and I ended up with 98 couples who kept diaries for up to a year. Just amazing stories, pouring in every day. I'd leap out of bed, to, you know, all these emails coming in every day, I'd leap out of bed to see what happened last night. <laughs> and just incredible things. One, I suppose one of the saddest stories was this man who said he got so sick of initiating sex that he finally said to his wife, okay, that's it, next time we have sex, you're going to initiate. That was eight years ago, and they haven't had sex since. <laughs> now, of course, it wasn't all about sex-starved men. I had what I call my juicy tomatoes, and they were the women who really craved sex. Uh, one in 10 of the women in my group were in that situation. I had some couples where, where they were both interested all the time, and they had some couples where they were both disinterested. But the real problem comes when one person wants sex more than the other. Uh, and it creates enormous tension in relationships and really detracts from happiness in a marriage or in a long-term relationship. One man said, I've got my own gulf war because the six inches between us in, a, in our bed feels like a thousand miles because there's this no-go zone where I'm not allowed near her. And the men were really interesting to me, pouring out how unhappy they were. Here's a young man, he's only in his 40s. I'm totally at a loss as to what to do. I do love her and I think she loves me, but I cannot live like a monk. I deliberately try not to mention sex much at all, but I'm so frustrated I don't know what to do. I cannot and will not continue like this. I refuse to go through life begging. Now, I was really in this interesting situation because I was conducting a little bit of a social experiment, if you like, and I could take some ideas that were coming through from one group and try them out on the other. And so women were saying to me, I hate being groped. They were talking about liking being cuddled, they liked having his arms around them, but inevitably the hand would stray to the bottom or the boobs and they got, you know, they hated that. I hate being groped, they said to me. So I had all these quotes from women about the grope and I sent them along to some of the men who were, taught, who were really writing well for me. And I said, tell me about the grope. Why do you do it if she says she hates it? And one man wrote back to me, he said, look, I know I'm gonna get into trouble. I know she doesn't like it, but it's me saying, hello, here I am. I still love you. I still want you. Where has she gone, the lover I married? 
And I found this really heartbreaking to hear this from men because the trouble is women think it's just about sex. Oh, for goodness sake, go and run around the Oval, you know, have a cold shower. <laughs> and what the men were saying to me, it's not, of course it's not about getting your rocks off. They know they can masturbate. It's not about sexual relief. It's about connection with the woman they love. It's about wanting her to want them and living day in, day out with being rejected. And that's a really difficult thing to live with, as the, woman say, the women who were in that situation well and truly said to me. The women were often very funny. They would talk to me about excuse, you know, how they get out of unwanted sex, the tricks they play, uh, often you know, pretending to be re re reading, and then the minute he comes in, they put their book down and pretend to be asleep. And I suppose the most amazing one, there was a woman who'd announced to her book club that she'd said to her husband, you can have 50 thrusts, but don't jiggle my book. As I said, the women were sometimes very funny, uh, but, but they were all so miserable about this. One lovely young mother of twins said, said to me that she'd apparently perfected the art of saying, get that thing away from me in her sleep. And she didn't want to be like that. I mean, she was very conscious of how much stress that was causing in her relationship. Uh, I want that wanting feeling back again, she said to me. So I did a lot of work trying to find out what's going on here. Why is there this big gap between men and women? And when you look at the research, one thing comes through very clearly. Most women, when they settle into their relationships, are stuck with a fragile, distractible libido. That they, they, I call it damp wood. It needs perfect conditions for it to light. And because we all live through stressful situations, we have all sorts of resentments and irritations in our life. It's very rare that we have spontaneous desire. Um, but the difference is that at the start of our relationships, we're often very different. We, we have what, there's a, there's a woman called Helen Fisher in the United States who's working on this period of relationships at the start where we're in, really in love. And there's a different brain chemistry, she finds, at that stage. That many women find that they ha ha really have a very strong desire at the early in the relationship and within a couple of years that disappears. Now the men are so different. Men have, many men said that they have an eternal flame, an itch that never goes away. I had men in their 80s saying that they you know, are still as interested they, as they ever had been in sex. Men have 20 times the level of testosterone that women do. One man wrote to me and said, I can totally understand why Clinton would want to have oral sex in the, uh, in the Oval Office. He's got the weight of the world on his shoulders. I mean, why wouldn't he use sex to escape and relax and get away from all of that? And I talk to women about that and they say, are you crazy? I mean, very few women, when they're really stressed out, feel like wanting sex. And yet a lot of the men who are writing for me could use sex to escape from whatever was bothering them. So what do we do about that? We've got drug companies around the world looking for the pink Viagra, trying to find something that will help women who want to do something about their low desire. And we haven't got very far with that. All we have is testosterone that works for about half the women who try it. We have lots of good self-help therapy books out there with lots of with good advice helping couples negotiate this stuff. But the thing that I talk about in my book, The Sex Diaries, which got me into a lot of trouble is the whole idea of just do it. Now, I didn't invent that. That came from a sex therapist in America called Mich Michelle Viner Davis. She talks about the fact that if you don't have spontaneous desire that, and you never feel like having sex, for the sake of your relationship, you have to put sex on the to-do list so you aren't leaving your partner feeling constantly rejected. And what's really changed is we now know something about desire that I didn't know when I was being trained 35 years ago, which is that many women can enjoy sex even if they don't have a desire to start off with. If you put the canoe in the water and start paddling, many women will find that desire kicks in. When I mentioned this, started talking about this, I got a little note from Michael Lunig saying, because I talk about putting the canoe in the water and start paddling, he said, is that where we got the expression canoodling from? <laughs> Only Michael Looney could think of that. Um, now, but that's a really important shift 
because I'm not saying you have to go ahead and bonk. You can, you know, you can start putting the canoe in and if it doesn't work for you, you can stop. You can give him pleasure in other ways. You've got a mouth, you've got a hands, you've got other ways of dealing with this issue. It's not about women suffering through unwanted sex. But of course it created an enormous hoo-ha when I started talking about this because of women's right to say no. And that whole notion that women should have a right to say no came from a really important place. It came from the 1960s when we first started learning about marital rape and sexual violence. And we realized women absolutely had to have the right to say no if we were gonna have civilized relations between men and women. It's interesting thinking back to the 1960s because this was also the time that we had Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. And he, as he got back in the lunar module, he made a strange little comment. He said, good luck, Mr. Gorski. And everyone was confused. The reporters kept asking him, and he would never tell them what the story was all about. And then finally, 20 years later, he agreed to talk about this. And he said that, he explained that when he was growing up, his Gorskis was his next door neighbor, and he was playing baseball with his mates, and the ball went over the fence, and he was outside the Gorski bedroom window and heard Mrs. Gorski yell at Mr. Gorski, sex, you want sex, you'll get sex when the kid next door walks on the moon. <laughs> Such a great story, huh? I was so excited when I heard that story. It's only an urban myth, but it's really interesting <laughs> because the world is full of Mrs. Gorskis. It's an amazing thing. It's a, the world is full of women who feel absolutely entitled to shut up shop if they're not interested in sex. Now, I find this most intriguing because it's not as if we're asking women to do anything terribly arduous or dangerous. It's not like cleaning an oven. Um, <laughs> A woman wrote to me the other day, and said, a, a female doctor, and she said it's not root, she's always telling her patients, it's not root canal therapy. Um, and when you think of what women do to look after their husbands, to try to make them happy, they cook three course meals, they iron tea towels, they do all this crazy stuff, when a five minute bonk every now and then, would that make that man a lot happier than a lot of the things they do for him? <clears throat> and the point is, I'm not saying, it's not a one-way street. I'm saying that whoever it is who's doing the rejecting in their, part, in their relationship needs to think about the impact of that, that rejection on their partner. And I also had men who were in that situation of, they had been the ones who were, who were rejecting their partner and their women were extremely unhappy about this. I had a woman who runs a prostate cancer support group the other day where she had a lot of women who thought they were just over sex. They didn't think they were remotely interested. And she said, they've got, she's always got women in tears. Talking about realizing how much it meant to them to have their husbands still want them. And when the men are in that situation of worrying about sexual performance and worrying about get erec getting erections, many don't in, go near their partners because it's all just too hard. I had one lovely couple writing for me last year who in a situation he had had a heart surgery and he was on medication that was causing him not to get erections. And she said she was so happy because he still wanted to make love to her. His affection and a desire for me was truly beautiful and something I'll treasure always. It's hard to put into words what his gentleness, feather-like touches, kisses and cuddles did for me. It was a display of how deeply he loved and wanted to be with me and made me feel pretty special. And she talked about these lovely afternoons they spent making love to each other. And then but she said to me, she loved his erection and she really missed it. I'm so sad when I look at what was once a magnificent pinnacle of manhood, which is now like a shriveled up weed that's been given a dose of Roundup. <laughs> now, what people talk to me about in the sex diaries, what people were really blown over about was the whole business of hearing men talk about sex. Because men tend to just make jokes about it, they very rarely talk openly about it. And I went um, on after, with a second project where I had 150 men writing for me about their sex life uh, and talking to me about all sorts of issues. What's it like to live with the, the five, you know, 20 times the testosterone that women do? 
Why do men take such risks for sex? The Tiger Woods, the men in trouble over not keeping their trousers zipped. Men's feelings about their bodies, men's feelings about making love to their women as they get older, the whole issue of pornography and how they cope with that. But absolutely at the heart of my, this a new project was the whole issue of erections and the age of Viagra. Getting me older men to talk about what it's like not to get erections anymore. This is not living, it's just existing. I've lost my best friend, even if he was a dickhead. <laughs> I have wonderful material with men talking about these new, well, fantastic new erection treatments that are out there and how they feel about them and the difference it makes their lives to be able to have a new lease of sexual life, particularly if they've had something like prostate cancer. 20,000 men a year are diagnosed with prostate cancer and most of those couples are going to have to deal with the changes that occur there. One in two men over 50 has problems with, with erections. So it's a very real issue. And it was just so fascinating to watch how couples negotiate through these sorts of issues. Uh, just not just the, the, you know, when you have a dramatic change like prostate cancer, but also just the changes that occur with age. Uh, men talking about, for instance, the fact that as they get older, they need more stimulation. You look at an 18-year-old's penis and it just pops up, doesn't it? Um, but a 50-year-old is going to need more encouragement. And so the couples were writing about how do you do that? How do you encourage her to touch the thing when she's never had to before? One man said that he, um, one man talked about the fact that, you know, she, she really found this very difficult. It's, it's as if she, she handled it as if she was dealing with a death adder, he said. <laughs> There's a very nice story about a couple who go to a shopping center and the car breaks down outside. And he says, oh, well, you go and do the shopping. Uh, I'll see what I can do. And he comes back. Uh, she comes back from the shopping. And there, you know, a whole lot of people gathered around the car. And she looks down and she's just horrified because she realizes, you know, legs are sticking out from under the car. And she realizes that he's got shorts on and no underpants. And his private parts have suddenly become very public ones. And she just doesn't know what to do. do. So she ducks down and tucks everything back in place, gets up and sees her husband staring at her from the other side of the... <laughs> other side of the car. The NRMA mechanic had to have three stitches in his forehead. <laughs> we need to be able to talk about sex. And finding a way of communicating about sex is the only way we have of retaining that special intimacy that allows couples to remain close and remain lovers throughout their lives and that's the ultimate form of happiness thank you